Wepa, welcome, bienvenidos everyone to today's webinar entitled The Forgotten American Students, Meeting the Academic and Language Needs of English Learners. My name is Doctora Feliz Ortiz Licon, and I serve as the Chief Policy and Advocacy Officer for Latinos for Education. We are a national nonprofit with the mission to develop Latino leadership and mobilize the Latino voice to promote practices and policies that remove barriers to educational opportunity. Joining me today, we have panelists representing Unidos US, Linwood Unified School District, the English Learner Success Forum, and the Youth Policy Institute Charter Schools, or YPICS. Before introducing our distinguished panelists, I would like to share a brief overview of dual language learners and English learners in this country. These populations are often called multilingual learners. Dual language learners are those students or children under the age of eight with at least one parent who speaks a language other than English at home. They make up 32% of the US young uh, child population and they're a growing percentage of our children in the United States. English learners, or often referred to as emergent bilinguals, are students in the K-12 school system who speak a language other than English at home. These students represent at the national level, 10% of the student population, or approximately 5 million students. In states like California, Texas, and Nevada, the figure is closer to 20% of the statewide student population. However, in, the, in a 10 year period from 2004 to 2014, the most rapid rate or rapid growth rate for English learners was actually concentrated in the Southeast. For instance, in South Carolina, the EO population increased within this 10 year, 10 year time frame by 236%. So English learners are in all states, all districts, all settings, urban, rural. According to the Migration Policy Institute, 82% of pre-kinder to fifth grade English learners are US born. In the secondary grades, six through 12, uh, six through 12th grade, 65% of English learners are US born. So when we speak of dual language learners, emergent bilinguals, English learners, multilingual learners, we are speaking about American children. They enter our public school system at a young age. They enter with talents. They enter with cultural and linguistic assets, but also the dual need to acquire English proficiency to meaningfully engage in the curriculum and the learning process and gain academic uh, growth. As a former English learner, I too was born in the United States to immigrant parents they made the conscious choice to teach me and my siblings Spanish at home. Learning Spanish gave me a cultural connection to my Mexican heritage. It gave me access to cultural traditions, to family members here and abroad, and to oral histories. But it also gave me the ability to use my first language as an asset and foundation to acquire a second language and ultimately gain proficiency in both English and Spanish. For far too long, English learners have been viewed and discussed through deficit perspectives and subtractive language. They have been misunderstood, their academic and language needs confounded, and their needs have gone unmet. The COVID-19 pandemic exacerbated the educational inequities experienced by English learners. Thus, as equity-minded educators and advocates, we must consider bold, committed, and sustainable actions and resources to ensure that these American students are not forgotten and that their academic and language needs are addressed and accelerated as we close the current academic year and plan for subsequent school years. Today, I'm joined by four panelists who will illuminate the issues encountered by English learners in the public school system. They will also highlight promising practices and policies that can specifically address the needs of this student population. But before I introduce my fellow panelists, I wanna give you an overview of the Rise Up Coalition. So these are the members of the Rise Up Coalition. We are a network or a coalition of school districts, charter networks, and organizations who came together with the firm why that is grounded in the needs of students of color. The system we know will default to traditional approaches post this pandemic. 
So we want to make sure that we capitalize, that we seize the moment, that we know that this is the time and now is the moment that Black, Indigenous, Latino, people of color led organizations can lead an opportunity to make sure that our systems really are responsive and reflective of our student population. Our goals include uh, publishing a national action agenda reflective of the priorities and needs of students of color and amplifying policies, models, and practices, as well as programs and tools that celebrate, honor, and enable students of color to thrive. So thank you for being part of this effort by joining this webinar. We do have a series of webinars. We started late April, and we have two forthcoming webinars, May 19th and May 26th, and we hope that you can join us then. So now it is my honor to introduce our panelists who will be turning on their cameras and joining us in, in a bit. Uh, we have Amalia Chamorro, Director of Education Policy Project at Unidos US. We have Dr. Gudiel Crosswaite, Superintendent of Linwood Unified School District. Crystal Gonzalez, Executive Director of the English Learner Success Forum. And Yvette Kingberg, Executive Director of Youth Policy Institute Charter Schools. Please help me welcome our panelists. Panelists, please turn on your cameras. Welcome panelists. Um, uh, audience, just so that you know, the format of the, today's panel will be that each panelist will provide about three minutes of opening remarks and introduce their system, their organization, and the why it is they do the work they do and who they work for, and in particular, English learners. Then we will uh, move into some questions, general questions for the panel, as well as individual questions for the panel. Uh, you can feel free to look down at your Q&A and type your questions, and we will allot about 10 minutes of our panel to answer those questions. So thank you. And we'll go ahead and start with Amalia Chamorro. If you could please provide opening remarks and introduce yourself and Unidos US and some of the work you're doing. Gracias, Felisa. Uh, well, I'm so glad to be here with all of you today. Uh, so I'm Amalia Chamorro. I'm the Director of Education Policy for Unidos US. Um, and we are the largest Latino civil rights organizations in the country. So um, I am an immigrant and I'm also an English learner. And I actually have stopped saying that I am a former English learner because I feel like for my whole life, I will always be and continue to be an English learner. And it's, and it's something that I'm actually really very, very proud of um, because it is part of my, my lived experience. Um, when I uh, immigrated to the US uh, when I was nine from Peru, uh, I really had to adapt and navigate a new school and foreign um, system with, with my parents along with my siblings. Um, and at the time, uh, bilingual education uh, was um, uh, part of the, the practice and system in California. So I was very fortunate to be able to, to come to the US and, and not only learn English in a bilingual um, education environment, um, but also be able to to retain my native language, which is very, very uh, important to me and has been a huge asset to me during my career trajectory. My parents um, were also bilingual teachers in California Central Valley. And so that al also had a huge um, effect and inspiration on, on me because they were always advocating for my siblings and I, um, and along with the students that they taught, um, many of them who came from, from migrant families um, and whose parents uh, you know, were always uh, asking for a little bit of assistance from my parents um, you know, to be able to advocate for their children as well. So in terms of how I came to um, UNIDA, so I majored in political science at UCLA. That's actually where Felisa and I met. Um, and you know, this was at a time in the late 90s where there was a lot of anti-immigrant and also anti-bilingual education policies um, that the state at the time uh, was considering and, and actually uh, did pass. Um, so that also had a huge impact on me and, and my focus um, and, and career. So I did um, go to law school, but really to become an, an advocate. And actually my first job out of law school was at NCLR, National Council of La Raza, which is now Unidos US. Um, and it's really where I got my, my grounding in, in public policy. And so it's just been, um, uh, really great for me to be able to come full circle and, um, and be leading education policy for, for Unidos US. So just a little bit about um, our organization, which um, many of you may be familiar with, but we have been um, doing this work for more than 50 years. Uh, and Unidos is really committed to uniting communities and um, 
and, and various groups to see common ground through collaboration. That is at the core of what we do, right? Familia and comunidad. Um, and we are really challenging the social and economic and political barriers that affect Latinos at the national and local levels. Um, our education work with respect to English learners is very much uh, focused in making sure that we are not only lifting up the experiences of ELs, um, since the majority of English learners in the US are Latino, about 77%, um, and lifting up the needs, but more importantly, as Felisa shared, the assets that English learners bring to our learning environment. So I look forward to um, getting to know you a little bit more through this panel and being able to share some of the insights and the work that we're doing here in DC and in some of our um, state legislatures as well. Thank you, Felisa. Thank you, Amalia. And our next panelist is Dr. Gudiel Crossway from uh, Superintendent Lewin Unified. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Gudiel Crossway, proud superintendent of the Linwood Unified School District. And just a little bit about Linwood. Uh, we're located about 15 miles southeast of Los Angeles, and we are considered an urban community. Linwood is a historically underserved community. And we currently serve about 13,000 K through 12 students, not including preschool and adult ed. 95% uh, of our students are Latino and about 5% African American, with about 30% of our students, a little bit over 30%, identified as English learners. Um, our work in Linwood has focused on systematically removing barriers and working to inspire our staff and our students to believe in themselves, and we want to make sure that all students have post-secondary options. Um, when we talk about the why, why am I here? So a little bit about me. So growing up, I too, uh, first generation in the US, English learner, and I'm still an English learner. My daughter just taught me how to say lemon, because I would always say lemon. <laughs> I don't know. So I too am an ongoing English learner and proud of that. And uh, my parents immigrated to the US in the 70s. And again, I'm the only person in my family to actually graduate from high school. My mother uh, completed second grade and my father completed or started the fifth grade. And my mom did not learn how to read until she was an adult uh, at, at, in church. And I wanna make sure for me that all of our families and the community of Linwood have opportunities that they deserve. And, and we know that unfortunately, uh, public institutions, including schools, have historically failed Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities. And for us, we have a, a big job, big task ahead of us, and we have to work to repurpose these institutions to truly serve all of our communities, including our English learners. And we have to be intentional, we have to be systematic, and we have to create the systems that, again, raise up our youth, inspire them, and prepare them for those post-secondary options. Glad to be here, thank you. Thank you, I'm inspired already. Okay, uh, our next panelist is Cristal Gonzalez, Executive Director of the EL Success Forum. Hi everyone, uh, so happy to be here uh, with this awesome group of uh, panelists uh, and, and those of you uh, dialing in today. Uh, my name is Crystal Gonzalez. Uh, I'm the founder and executive director of the English Learner Success Forum. Uh, I was born and raised in the great state of New Mexico, um, and I uh, currently reside here after many years, uh, over 20 years being away uh, in places like New York City, Chicago, Houston, all over. Um, I started my career as a fourth and fifth grade bilingual teacher. And so my why really in everything that I do today is really grounded um, of my students and families that I worked with. Uh, but I have to say my, my biggest motivation, like my peers that just shared their experiences and, and their familias is grounded in my familia here. And the many who didn't have access to their opportunity in our traditional education system. Um, it's, it's crazy when I tell people this, if you know New Mexicans, they probably say this all the time, but I am eighth generation New Mexican. And uh, ironically, I'm the first uh, person, first generation college graduate in my family. Um, and the reason I say that, because I, I do go back to some of the things we're talking about today. Our system is just failing uh, many of our families and our kids 
And I think that's why we're all on this call today really is to, is to collaborate and collectively advocate on their behalf. Um, my parents and many others that uh, again are my motivation and my big why in this work. Um, so about the English Learner Success Forum, we were about five years old, we're a nonprofit. Uh, we work all over uh, the country. Um, and we really started when uh, this is right after uh, the high, you know, Common Core and academic standards came to be. Um, and like everything else, we were finding that a lot of our EL students were being left out of the conversation uh, when it came to providing professional learning or curriculum uh, aligned to those standards. Um, and for ELS being the fastest growing student pop population in our schools, uh, it is unacceptable that there's still an afterthought for many of the reforms happening. Uh, so out of all the things we could focus on, we decided to focus on uh, the, the supply of high quality instructional materials and also uh, working with uh, states and districts and anybody who wants to demand better uh, on behalf of our English learners. So our mission here at ELSF is really to collaborate uh, with field leading researchers, district leaders, state leaders, teachers, content creators, um, anyone who really wants to improve what we have uh, for our teachers and our students um, and make sure that anything that we're doing in core content is really addressing their linguistic and cultural needs of our English learners. And as we'll talk a little bit more, uh, I think the pandemic proved that our familias are just as important in this, in this as well. So really happy to be here and for this conversation with all of you today. Thank you. And I think that if you uh, want to join the equity agitators, please sign on. We are always happy to receive more. Um, and our final panelist, uh, last but not least, is Yvette Keenberg, Executive Director of the Youth Policy Institute Charter Schools. Wow, so I'm just overwhelmed by the rest of my, my panelists and I, I do share some of your stories and backgrounds. Um, my why, first I'd just like to start with, um, I was born in New Jersey and raised in Brooklyn um, in a predominantly black and Puerto Rican neighborhood. I, my, I learned to speak Spanish from my best friend's father who refused to speak to me in English and uh, she learned how to fry chicken and cook collard greens and black eyed peas and rice. Um, and, um, and, and the other piece is, is I'm, I'm the oldest girl in a family of nine. I am the first to graduate from college. And a couple of those triggers when I think back on my childhood is I remember two, two things. In sixth grade, I had a sixth grade teacher who basically would tell me every day of that year that she believed in me and that I was college bound. And that just stuck with me for years. The second piece that really just stuck in my mind was in high school, I remember our counselors kind of pulling all the 12th graders into the auditorium and uh, displaying the SAT scores and how, and, um, and that was when I first became aware of data that impacts our community because I learned as a 12th grader that the African-American kids scored the worst, the boys sc scored the worst, and then the next group that scored the worst were um, Latino boys. And I remember thinking at that particular point in time, that's when I decided when I was going to college that I wanted to become a teacher and I wanted to inspire um, others like my sixth grade teacher had inspired me. And I just, I determined that day that I was gonna change that statistic, not only for me, but for my siblings and generations to come. So 32 years later, um, I began this profession as a bilingual educator and administrator. I started out as a first grade bilingual teacher. I wanted to give back to my community because um, I felt it was really important to be able to provide moms. My dream was that I could provide moms the same opportunities that I had growing up. And later I got married to my husband and he and I, he's from, he's, his family is from Puerto Rico. We have an amazing, bright, literate, smart, bilingual, biliterate African-American and Puerto Rican son who's about to graduate from UC Berkeley on Friday. I have to just brag about that. And yes, he attended my middle schools. <laughs> Um, he was mad at me that I didn't open our high school until 2015 and he wasn't able to go to that school. But that first graduating class at the Bragg, statistically 100% of them were accepted into 33 different colleges and universities. 24% of that class um, were students with IEPs and 40% um, of those students were students that were English learners. They were too were accepted to UC Berkeley, UC Davis, UC Santa Barbara. And so at the end of the day, 
I'm excited that I've had this opportunity to oversee the three YPIC schools, which um, serve approximately a thousand students um, in two communities in Los Angeles, both in Pacoima and Pico Union. And of our 1,000 scholars, 99% are Latinx, 45% are EL, and 24% are students with IEPs. And um, our system of change basically focuses on um, we don't give kids a choice. We program every child for A through G courses because we, we want them to have an option they can opt out. And we're gonna scale up and chain up and close the gap. Uh, the second thing that we decided to do was to dump the traditional grading system because we feel like it fails too many of our kids and isolates them from getting into courses that they need. Um, so we use mastery grading. And then the last thing that we do is we really focus on project-based learning because we can use our kids' backgrounds and as assets as they're learning in that way. So we have found that ELs thrive in a project-based learning environment. And so that's who we are. And I'm so excited to um, share this panel with you today. Thank you, Yvette. And just for those that are not California-based, A through G courses are the 15 courses as, uh, sequence of courses needed to be eligible for the four-year institutions. Um, so my first question, and, and Crystal, you alluded to this, what the pandemic has meant for our students, for all communities, but in particular, our, our most vulnerable students, including English learners. So this is for anyone or everyone. Uh, how has the pandemic shaped the experience and needs of English learners? Who wants to take a first step at that? How has this pandemic shaped? We know it's it's definitely altered the reality for many of us, but specifically for English learners, what have we seen? What have we learned? I'll just jump in and maybe start at the kind of the national landscape of, of what we've seen and, and would be really um, great to hear from my colleagues to and Pierce on the panel in terms of what that's looked like on the ground, right? Um, but at the national level, we know that, um, you know, in a recent survey by uh, Next 100, for example, two thirds of teachers of English learners said that you know, they felt like their students, their EL students were not doing well, right? Um, and also most of the, the EL teachers also said that, um, you know, they didn't feel like they had the resources, right? Or felt equipped to be able to, to help their EL students to the extent that they felt was needed. Um, most of them also said that um, many of their EL students, most of them actually um, did not have access to um, the internet um, or the devices, which we know many schools, right? Have, did step in throughout the year, right, to be able to buy those, um, but not, not every EL was actually able to have the, the essential tools they needed to just access, let alone meaningfully participate in remote learning. And then just most recently, just two, maybe two, three weeks ago, the first federal survey came out um, from the Department of Education um, about uh, remote learning and also which students were coming back to in-person instruction. And uh, about 52% of English learners were still learning fully remote uh, compared to 27% of white students. So we do see a lot of those gaps, you know, to Yvette's point, like this is what the data is telling us. Um, and while it may not give us the whole picture, right, it does give us some indication of what some of the challenges that our English learners um, have experienced um, throughout the last year. I can jump in too and just share with you that in Linwood, Linwood was a community that was hit hard with COVID. And we have about 72,000 residents. And at one point, you know, around January, 13,000, over 13,000 had tested positive. And so the fear, the anxiety here was different. We were compared on a national media to communities like Brentwood and Beverly Hills, who had a very, very different uh, COVID rate. And, and those are the numbers of people who tested, right? So the, the numbers were actually even higher. But then on top of that, we lost a lot of family members here. I have kids who unfortunately lost a parent while they're in high school, middle school, and elementary. And so for us, what we noticed with our families is yes, we had some challenges with the devices and we passed out 10,500 devices. We passed out the hotspots. But what we were also seeing is that our families were struggling with food and housing insecurity, and they didn't have the luxury to work remotely. If they didn't go to work, there was no food on the table. And then on top of that, they had to decide, do I pay for internet access or put food on the table? 
And for some of our families, it also meant that they had to be separated. Families who are dealing with COVID rates, again, not having the luxury to work remotely, they didn't want to expose their children or, or grandma, right? And so that meant that some of the family members had to go live with someone else. And we had kids who were moved out of the area and now they're on their own and they're English learners and they have an adult that maybe is not their parent that they're living with in a different environment. And so for us, it was also addressing how do we support our students with the mental health, the parents and the guardians with that. And so for us, what we had to do is collaborate with the local churches. We had to collaborate with the city, with the sheriff's department and come together as a community and ask ourselves, how can we all come together and collaborate to support all of our students? Because as, as a school district, yes, we can pass out the devices and do some other things, but we couldn't do it alone. And I'll share one other thing is that we, we set up a, we opened up a food pantry that was initially set up for our unhoused youth, about 50 families uh, picking up food every week. That food pantry quickly turned around to serving over 500 families on a weekly basis. And, and that just goes to show you that the, the, the type of the need and again, the historical underserved community uh, in terms of lack of access to healthcare, jobs, the type of jobs and things like that. So for us here in Linwood, our kids had layer upon layer upon layer and the devices, that was the, the least of their concerns. I echo that, um, Gudiel, we had some of the same experiences with our schools. And um, I would just add that at the high school level, we found that we first we felt we had to focus to help teachers to how to um, um, how, how to deliver instruction well, once you've closed all those gaps of making sure that they had all the technology. Now, how do we do distance learning and how do we focus on really focusing on giving kids opportunities to continue to talk and less teacher talk, more kid talk. That was the biggest challenge. And second language learners need to have the opportunities to speak in class. So that was one, focusing on teachers and making sure that they had tools to be able to give them time to practice this new way of actually teaching during distance learning. And then the second thing that we realized is that our MIAs, like our students that were missing in action at the high school level, they weren't just missing in action from the screen or with their screens turned off. They were actually missing from school because during the day, we would hear them trying to call in, but they were, you'd hear all this construction site stuff going on in the background because our, our high school kids were working full-time and trying to go to school full-time. So then we had to work with our teaching staff to say, how do we meet the kid, meet needs of our kids? And I'm grateful for the team of educators that I get to walk alongside. They were like, well, then we need to flip this. We need to figure out how to allow kids time after school, which even through eight o'clock at night for them to turn in assignments and to be able to talk with us after they're done with their, their eight hour full-time work in construction during the day. So those are some of the things, the additional things that we had to pay attention to and our teachers were willing to do that. And I'm grateful for their willingness and understanding the need and how to best serve our babies. Thank you, Yvette. And I think all of you mentioned some very important um, issues so that the inequities that we had that we already have pre-pandemic were just compounded and exacerbated. Um, and so I'm gonna move towards some individual questions for you all. And uh, Dr. Crosswaite, I wanna, I wanna elaborate more a little bit because you did mention that the basic needs needed to be met, right? And we know that those basic needs had to be met and then we're thinking about access to technology to access the curriculum. But as we are now hopefully turning the corner on the pandemic, we know that the federal government has provided funds for COVID recovery. We know that those will be coming to the districts. Some of them have already arrived. What are the plans? What are the plans that Linwood Unified has to use those funds, understanding that we have virtual dropouts, understanding that we had unfinished learning, learning loss, language loss. What are the plans to use those funds to meet the needs of the students? Yeah, I, you know, I think uh, Yvette said it earlier too. So in terms of the plans, we're developing our plans and making sure that they're aligned to our strategic plan and our mission of, of supporting students and families. But at the same time, we wanna engage in conversation with our students, with our parents, with our staff, with our community members, because I don't want as a superintendent and neither does our board wanna make decisions without hearing from them. And I think that 
one of the things that we know is that there are some things we cannot go back to. And we have to be able to work, do a better job and reflect on our practices and use these opportunities to, to come out stronger. And, and, and as Yvette said, is build the capacity, sustainability. And so for us, it's about what are we going to do differently moving forward to better support our students? And we know that we have to invest a lot in our staff because here in California, we have this model where an, an English learner goes to a class for English language development. And I was a eighth grade uh, ELD teacher as well, taught high school, but that 45 minutes of instructional period or time for, to focus on English language development, it's not enough. Every teacher is an English language development teacher. And so what we wanna see is sustainability, long-term building up the capital here in the community and not just with our staff, but I got grandmothers now who are well-versed on Facebook Live and they're following us on our YouTube channel. We have a, a coffee with parents that's live stream now. And it's not us doing the, the coffee chats, it's our parents in front of the Zoom, in front of Facebook Live or on Google Meets who are facilitating these conversations. So for us in Linwood, it's an opportunity to build the capital across the board, students, family members, staff, and, and really move forward in a different direction. And I think too, is that when we think about the justice and inequities, we have a lot of work ahead of us. And so we also wanna use this as an opportunity to reflect on what is in our core curriculum. What materials are we using? Are they culturally linguistic? Do our black and brown kids see themselves in the material? And if they're not, then we have to do a better job of enhancing that curriculum. And sometimes it means that as a school district, we can't wait for the state to get it done. We got to charge ahead and lead by example because it's the right thing to do for our kids. Thank you for that. And we are a big state. So sometimes it's, it is important for the leaders at the local level to lead the way. Uh, Crystal, let's talk a little bit about the quality of instruction that students receive or are still receiving in virtual settings, but specifically during the peak of the, of the pandemic. Were teachers prepared? Were they able to engage? What do we know about the impact and how do we better prepare teachers so that one, English learners are not just the responsibility of the EL specialist or the Title III coordinator, but they're the responsibility of every educator, every adult in the ecosystem of education. So uh, what do we know about the quality of instruction and how can we better prepare our teachers? Absolutely. Well, Guliel, I'm, I'm glad you said that because I, I think, uh, and, and related to the question that came to the panelists about funding, this is where we've really have an opportunity. Um, and, you know, and I think the, the importance here is not a focus on remediation, which really makes me nervous that we're going to see uh, data or even if testing is moving forward and we see our EL students are far behind that the, the solution is going to be remediation, which is the wrong choice to make in that sense, right? We really got to be focusing on acceleration. Um, and I do think that's where materials have a critical play in, in what this looks like. And this is where collectively, we really believe that we've got to demand more from publishers that are developing materials, but even those that develop our own materials, are we really keeping that bar high? Um, so to your question, um, you know, Felisa, you know, what do we know about what it's been during the pandemic? And honestly, it's been a mishmash everywhere. Uh, we've heard of places where educators have reported that much of the responsibility has landed on their shoulders. And you all probably remember that was the time when online, si online sites were being passed left and right among our educators saying, who has sites to this and that and uh, different languages and what this looks like. Um, so there was a time and place for that, but what that showed us was that, um, you know, our leaders going back to leadership and really holding that bar high on materials and instruction that need to be that foundation for not only all kids, but in particular our English learners. Um, and this is where language integrated language supports. I liked what all of you said about, you know, this is a, a point and transition where we got to do better where L's are no longer an afterthought. Um, I know when we were teaching back in the day, it was the EL educator's responsibility to figure it out and make these adaptations to integrate ELD standards into the core content. 
now we're past that, right? I really do believe that when we have materials and instruction that is very explicit around language development, it actually benefits every kid in that classroom. It benefits not only English learners, but our students with disabilities. It benefits students behind grade level, but we have those intentional scaffolds and attention to strong language and, and support. And again, the focus being grade level content because we do not want to remediate. We don't want to dumb down. Um, and I think that's really reflective in what that could be. So I do think we've seen a mishmash in places where it was strong. I will honestly say it's those places that had strong curricular and uh, instructional leadership at the top that said, this is what we're using. It's high quality. It's aligned to the content and what our kids need. And we're going to provide either the supports teachers need to scaffold up for our English learners and other students, or we're going to train you and really think about what does it mean to have, to your question, the oral language aspect of our work. Um, I think of places like what, you know, Oakland Unified and their multilingual department did about using what they currently have, which is good curriculum and really making sure all of their teachers were trained about how to develop oral language, how to develop listening skills remotely, because that's a part where, again, curriculum is not a silver bullet, but this is where our support for teachers come in. And then I think the last thing that I will say on this point is, is just how important families are in our students' learning. And I think this is also a transition point in really calling for better materials that actually consider the needs of, of our L's, but also of their families. What role do they play? And I think this lens is going to be incredibly important for all of us to come and, and understand that we must respect, affirm, and provide guidance on using home language as a resource and an asset. Um, and this is part of, uh, I think, a changing narrative that we need to have in our system to, be to better serve our students. But I will say, I do think we have to advocate for better materials and, and provide that guidance, which, which, which is what we do at ELSF and really pushing the field uh, in that direction. Thank you. And, and what I heard is the need for integrated instruction, just like we have some frameworks here in California, but also designated. And that's the piece that I feel was sacrificed during the, the you know, the shocking move to, to virtual instruction because we didn't have designated and, you know, no one to really blame the, the system was not set up for it. And I think that uh, teachers needed to be supported in that regard. Um, Amalia, I want to hear a little bit about some policy recommendations that only those U.S. may be putting forward uh, in terms of policies for English learners, but also funding. I know that there are several campaigns uh, that you've all spearheaded to make sure that we have additional funds for the student population. So can you share a little bit about that? Yes, thank you. And actually, just this morning, um, because we are at the federal government, um, it's, it's budget season. So this is what the appropriations process is, is underway. And so just this morning, we circulated a letter on the Hill uh, with Congress um, signed by 122 organizations, including EL Success Forum. So thank you, Crystal, for joining that letter. Um, and this was a letter that Unidos US and NAVE, the National Association for Bilingual Education, um, co-led um, and drafted um, and circulated to our partners um, in the last few days. And you know, we are calling for um, a significant investment in Title III, which is the dedicated federal funding stream for English learners. Um, so we know that there's you know, other funding streams like Title I, uh, you know, which um, serves low-income students and many EL students do attend Title I schools. Um, but this is the only dedicated targeted funding stream specifically to meet the needs of, of English learners. And, you know, it has not kept up with the pace of the growth of the EL population. So the U.S. Department's own data shows that in a 15-year span between 2001 and 2016, the EL population grew by 28 percent. Um, but since 2010, we've actually seen a decrease in the Title III funding when you take inflation into account, and that's just unacceptable, right? Um, this is a new day. We have a huge opportunity with a new administration, also a new Secretary of Education, who is himself an English learner, um, and so he he does get uh, you know where we're coming from and, and the experience of English learners, and does see English learners as bringing those assets to the classroom. So um, we're very excited to um, you know to to work on this campaign. Um, more to come, but we are calling for two billion dollar investment with from Congress um, for Title III. 
Um, and we're also working um, and advocating to the administration for the Department of Education, right, to make some um, need, much needed changes and also to provide the leadership that has been lacking um, for the last several years when it comes to, you know, shifting the narrative and also setting the tone um, for how English learners um, should be recognized. Um, and that starts with even making changes like changing the name of the office of uh, English language acquisition. I mean, that in and of itself, English language acquisition, right, that is a deficit based um, name that doesn't really take into account that the assets of English learners. And we were really hard to hear uh, Secretary Cardona in a hearing last week calling it the Office of Multilingual Le Learners. So we hope that, you know, um, definitely sets the tones and brings about the, the much needed change. But those are just a couple of things that we're working on. Um, obviously there's a lot more, but we look forward to, um, to working with our partners in this space to, to continue to make that push. Yes, we absolutely need those additional 2 billion. Um, Yvette, I wanted to ask you about uh, some of the work that YPIX is doing, paying close attention to duly identified English learners. These are the students that are identified as both uh, English learners and students with disabilities. And so uh, what support services do you provide for these students? How do you monitor their language development while still looking that you're to their IEP, making sure you're meeting the goals of the IEP? And then how do you train your teachers to understand that intersectional identity and its intersectional needs of students while being able to tease them out and meet the distinctive needs? Uh, so I know there's a lot of questions in that, but it is important for us to understand that English learners are intersectional students and they have different identities and those identities now have different needs that need to be met uh, collectively, but also separately. So tell us a little bit about the duly identified English learners. So actually, Felisa, we, as in doing our work with our ELs and, and, and um, trying to find root causes as to why some of them were not progressing or we were not able to get um, we designate them we actually stumbled upon these trends from and that's how we discovered wait a second there's a population of kids across our systems that are just never redesignating no matter what we do we train all of our teachers um, in el strategies so that in our school system everyone owns um, els moving ahead right um, and so but we couldn't put our hand on it. And so when we actually, um, when the, these, these two identities bubble to the top and we re were able to recognize that, they, that we had students with special needs and students that were ELs, what that forced us to do was to take a better look at what is the actual disability for this child. And it's sort of like, what's the definition of insanity? We're gonna keep retesting this kid with the LPAC in that very area that they have a disability for special education. And it's sort of like, well, why would we continue to do that? And so what we did was we basically, we go through and we, I, we look at what is the, um, the disability and if their IEP has that named in their, in their IEP, we don't test that on LPAC. And we basically have created an, alt test, an alternate assessment pathway for our students who are SPED, and that are um, ELs and also I um, have an IEP. Um, we track our students. I, all of our kids kind of have an IEP in our system, whether they're um, a student with special needs or not. And so we have um, the, 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 our, what we call the individualized learning plan for our traditional students. So we, we track through Illuminate and we track our students and we have regular quarterly data, data meetings to track all of our subgroups. And so in those quarterly data, data meetings, we, we take a look at where they are, right? So what do they need? Um, believe it or not, when you pull and account for those other um, disabilities, our kids are still falling into the same pockets of needing support in terms of language acquisition. But instead of going, we're gonna pull you out here, we're gonna pull you out here. What we've done is we've done more of the integrated ELD for the supports for those students. And we recognize that using project-based learning and being able to give kids more language opportunities while we're still um, um, pushing the high rigor, to, rigor for them in terms of, uh, of uh, learning goals and outcomes and indicators, um, and also using lots of rubrics for them. So, and, and students being connected to their, their own stories and their own data. So our, our classroom cycles about every two weeks, 
students and teachers are talking about their data, kids understand what their data is, and kids are really being able to understand, oh, I need to do this. Some of our kids coming to us didn't even know they were identified as an EL. What does that mean, right? Just understanding what those labels mean and how do we move through the cycle. So I think a, a combination of making sure that our teachers are clear about how to track student data in the Illuminate system, which is our SIS system, making sure that students understand who they are in the system and understanding what their labels are and what they mean and what their assets are. So the bottom line is, is that this may be something that you struggle, but what your gift and talents are here. So let's really highlight those and provide you additional supports. Um, so it's a lot of teacher training, a lot of ownership of teachers across. We cross train our gen ed student teachers with our um, special education teachers um, in terms of um, having them work side by side so that during the, that our teachers our gen ed teachers are becoming better proficient with um, special education teacher strategies to access content and in, in, in instructional practices and our um, our gen ed teachers are, are becoming better um, at being able to um, um, apply um, strategies to support ELs and um, students with um, um, special needs. So I think really focusing on supporting teachers, understanding system-wide, wh what does the data say? What are the real root causes? And believe it or not, we have really been able to move many of our kids. And it's amazing how excited that they feel that they're capable. And once we, we designate them, they try and they they just power through because it's sort of like then this block. It's like the SAT, right? We know that that's the one score that kids get stuck on if they don't score well. It's the gatekeeper. I feel like the same is is it, that it's the same for our ELs with redesignation. It's like the gatekeeper. And if kids don't understand where they are in that process and how they can. Um, um, own and set their own goals and for teachers to be able to work with them and understand what their IEPs say versus what their, their, EL, their EL snapshot states, then I think just supporting all three, the student, the teacher, and families about that process and making sure that there's a system in place to not hold them back based on a test that they're never going to pass if it's aligned to their, their special ed disability. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bet. And uh, again, for non-Californians, uh, LPAC is the English Language Proficiency Assessment of California. I know most other states use the WIDA. Um, and we, we do want to move to some questions from the audience. And Gary Gonzalez asked the question, in planning for next year and knowing we have extra state and federal funds, what are some of uh, some actions and activities that will go the furthest in narrowing the gap between our ELs and our English-only students? Quien quiere? Who, who, who oh, wants to answer? Crystal, Crystal. Yeah. I mean, I, I do think uh, it, this is going to be really helpful to prioritize, I guess, again, materials with embedded language supports, integrated as well as designated. Um, and I think, you know, we have a couple of states. I will say California, for example, is going through their mathematics adoption processes and what this looks like. So I do think this, uh, if you can get involved in that earlier rather than later, that might be an opportunity, but also for where those, that funding is coming up in the near term, uh, I think the caution here is again on remediation, don't look for those shiny, beautiful, um, you know, uh, those packages that are just great for L's. I do think it has to be a comprehensive, coherent approach where um, this is really where the collaboration happens between your core content um, leaders and uh, your EL leaders, the multilingual leaders at the, at the district and local levels. Um, but I do think we have the opportunity on, on the material side to get a lot better on what that looks like. And so I could share some more resources at the very end about some, some uh, self-assessments and some pulse checks if people want to know like, wait, don't we have something that's already good? Um, I think when, when we dig into those a bit more, we find that people are a little surprised by how uh, their materials just aren't up to par. So that would be my two cents is that we could prioritize uh, some of this funding for some of the critical learning that needs to happen on the ground. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll echo that. It's building the capacity, building up your capital. Um, there's a lot of vendors out there selling licenses and, and, and the materials, the next best thing. For education is about that interaction, that relationship between the child and, and the teacher, the instructor. 
and, and you have to invest on your, you know, your human capital. And, and what's good for EL students is gonna be good for everyone else. Um, so, so that's what I'll emphasize. And then the other thing is too, for me is, is, is removing barriers is, you know, these laws were passed generations ago, but we still have so many barriers and obstacles that prevent our kids from having a, a good quality education. So as institutions, we have to remove those barriers and ask ourselves, what can we do to enhance and support and acknowledge the strengths that our kids are coming into? And um, the, even the term newcomer, I, it's, it, I struggle with it. I had a conversation with my wife this morning, but our kids are all born here. I was born here, but I would be considered a newcomer. It's like, we gotta change the language and, 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 and make sure that we're supporting all of our kids. I think you hit on something that is critical. I think the first way to address and narrow is to understand and, and acknowledge and identify who your English learners are. There's a lot of misconceptions of who these students are, right? Uh, I think people automatically think that they're the newcomers, that they're immigrant students, that they just arrived. So how can we expect that they're gonna be achieving at the same levels as their English only counterparts when in fact they've been in our school system since preschool, TK, kinder. Um, so knowing who your students are and also demanding that that's part of our teacher credential programs, right? You, you could get a credential without ever learning about English learners. Um, so there's a lot that, that we ought to do. Uh, thank you for that question. I do see another question here. Uh, I think this is for you, Yvette. This is from Melissa Ray. For alternative assessments, do the students have to have a specific disability like intellectual delay or a learning disability? And I think she's talking about alternative assessments to the LPAC, which is our oh, English proficiency. So, so what we do is we, um, so the, we still use the LPAC, but depending on, let's just say, for example, a kid has a, um, um, a, a disability in terms of um, 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 linguistic disability. Well, then we're not going to, you know, so we're going to take a look at which part of the LPAC would that be impacted by if the kid took that test and will never ever score well enough to pass that section. So we look at which part of the LPAC that we're going to eliminate and we basically use um, our formative, our, we, we have other alternative assessments that we use like iReady assessments and we see how are the kids growing on those iReady assessments in relationship to the rest of their peers. And if there's certain standards of growth that they're making, we will use that instead of the, say the, 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 the language portion of the LPAC. So that's how we do that. And if you like to get more information, um, I will make sure that we have access to my email and I can send you the actual grid that we use in terms of how we um, assess kids with that. Thank you. And just to clarify, in California, there is an alternate LPAC assessment that is limited to 1% of the students with disabilities population. Um, so we're running a little bit out of time. And so I'm going to give you 30 seconds to do a call for action. Uh, and I know all of your respective LEAs and organizations are working uh, to really uphold the rights and, and supports for English learners. So any call for action, we could start with Yvette, then we have 30 seconds. I would say take a look at your special needs populations and students who are double identified, because that may be an area, area where you can eliminate a barrier so that we can have our kids move forward. Gracias. Mm -hmm. Amalia. Yeah, I would say um, there's a lot of uh, money that has already gone to states from the federal government um, under the American Rescue Plan and in our remaining one third, about 40 billion, that's going to be going out um, over this summer. But um, part of that is that um, the department is requiring states and LEAs to have a, a meaningful plan for community engagement. Um, so to uh, Superintendent Crossway's point, right, he's planning to engage his stakeholders, his communities, his families, and helping to inform those plans. So I would just, that would be the call to action, right, to get involved in that community um, input process. Thank you. Ojo with the money. Uh, Crystal. Yes, I'd say two things. Um, you know, one is just uh, getting the right people at the table when it comes to uh, advocating or representing our EL community. Um, and as you guys know, our focus on materials. So we do have a couple of resources where there are self-assessments out there to really know. We've got one for instructional materials self-assessment and one for educators to just ask, are my materials working for my English learners? 
And then the other thing I would just say is we do have a coalition uh, that is really focused on the ecosystem for EL students. It's called the Coalition for EL Equity, elequity.org. Uh, we have a sign on that we're trying to get folks to sign on and really demand more from not only our system, but also those that are leading systems and want to do better uh, on behalf of our EL community. So I'd end on that one too. Thank you. And Dr. Crosswade. I would say, you know your kids in Linwood, every student is known by name. Uh, any subgroup that they belong to and, and their data. And, and that's what guides our decisions. Um, we have to move away from what's most convenient for us as adults to what is best for kids. And then thirdly is whatever you're saying, you got to back it up with the dollar. You got to back it up with some fiscal personnel support to truly address the inequities that we have. And equality is not equity. So we have to repurpose our funds as well. Thank you so much. I wanna appreciate all of my panelists uh, that have joined us here today. Thank you for imparting some nuggets of knowledge and for making the time and the space for this conversation to happen. I wanna thank the Rise Up Coalition, Digital Promise in particular. Thank you for the tech support. Please make sure you join us uh, for the next webinar, which is the new hybrid uh, technology designated to create uh, design, sorry, designed to create access on May 19th. Please do register. Thank you attendees for joining us today.